I hope this is a good week for you as we continue in this time of devotionals uh, virtually. Um, I usually record these a week ahead. In fact, um, I'm recording this one on uh, the 17th, which of course is Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the Lenten season. All across the world, Christians uh, also are observing uh, this day and this period of time, uh, 40 days before uh, Easter, about six weeks. Um, it is a time of reflection, of confession, to take seriously um, our own sinful nature and to consider um, how God chose uh, to deal with the ravages, the destructive power of, of sin through the redemptive acts of his son. So we uh, are going to look today at uh, a story that's related to his own experience of 40 days. The number 40, as you I'm sure know, uh, is a familiar one in, in, in scripture. But this particular uh, connection is between two journeys in the wilderness, one by the people of Israel after they left the bondage of slavery in Egypt, and one just prior to uh, the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Uh, the children of Israel wandered for 40 years, a generation. Um, and unfortunately, um, their generation didn't uh, understand fully the opportunities that God presented to them. On the other hand, Jesus in his 40 days um, is um, very much aware that there is a lot at stake. Uh, in his own experience, he will encounter uh, his adversary, the devil. Uh, these days, it seems like it uh, is very popular to discount his very existence, which I'm so sure uh, Satan is very happy to do, uh, realizing that uh, if people don't believe in him and don't take him seriously, then he has pretty much free reign. And as we look around the world today, it seems as if he is exercising that reign. Um, Jesus very much understood um, the um, potential for destruction and uh, disruption that Satan was capable of and was certainly uh, very much involved in in the world. So when Jesus goes out, um, he does so for a period of prayer and fasting. Um, I don't know if you're fasting uh, during this season. A lot of people do that, particularly on Ash Wednesday and the placement of the ashes on the head and so forth that indicate a, a contrition, a contrite spirit. Um, that Jesus was growing weaker and um, he was in fact a man and understood and experienced what it meant to be frail and vulnerable. And at this point when Satan appears, uh, it is so. I'm going to read you a couple of verses from the Gospel of Matthew related to the temptation experience. This is chapter four of Matthew. Then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, well, this is the beginning of three temptations. And Satan knows where we are weakest, where we are most vulnerable. That's where he attacks. Um, he's sly. He knows how to reach us at uh, our lowest level and um, is, is brilliant in his strategies. Um, and he thought, that he would catch Jesus at his weakest moment and therefore began to toy with him. What were those three temptations? You again might rem uh, remember these. Uh, I'm reading out of a book um, that my son introduced me to. I don't think you can see it very well, but it is the Jesus of the Gospels. And you see the name down there, Kostenberger. Uh, this is a, an excellent book that is, um, it's, it's almost like a, a survey of the New Testament. And um, very well done. But he mentions these three, and I'll just read from his text. The first is, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The second one is, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And lastly, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That also uh, illustrates a connection with the wilderness experience of the children of Israel. For Moses, uh, actually, um, uh, quotes these things uh, are uh, in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter six through eight. Uh, it was Moses' address to the children before they were to enter the promised land. So he was setting the stage for 
the right kind of relationship with each other, but most importantly with God. And so when uh, Jesus is quoting scripture, which is always a good way uh, to deal with the challenges of life, um, he quotes these verses from Deuteronomy, from the experience of the 40 years wandering of the Israelites. So when you think about it, um, you begin to realize that God's story continues to be revealed to us. And it is not uncommon at all for Jesus to um, quote uh, Moses or one of the prophets. Um, he's very, very much, as you can imagine, he's very well versed in, in, in scripture and is able to apply it. I think again, um, the role of, of knowing and memorizing scripture, um, uh, should be, um, uh, accented. It should be something that we all strive to do because there's nothing like the power of God's word. So when Jesus is confronted in his weakness, he turns to something he knows that will give him strength, and that is the word of God. So he says um, to, uh, to Satan, no, I'm not going to do it your way. I'm not even going to do it my way. I'm going to do it my father's way. When we reach that point in our lives when nothing but the will of God is at the heart of uh, who we are, then we really understand what it means to be a follower of Christ. It, there's... There's no uh, no coincidence in the fact that uh, we are stressing here at Williams during this transition time the idea that the will of God is paramount. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Um, probably got that wrong, but I think you know um, that that's what we see illustrated right here in this story in Scripture, um, that Jesus was not going to settle for anything other than fulfilling the mission that God had sent him to accomplish. So nothing more, nothing else, nothing less. The will of God is paramount. So this encounter with Satan, uh, I, I have an idea that Satan was growing a little frustrated because Jesus wasn't as weak as he might have appeared. His strength, again, came from beyond his physical abilities. Uh, he's weak. He is hungry. As the Bible says, he's famished. Um, I doubt very seriously that many of us have truly been famished, uh, where we did not have enough to sustain us. And Jesus was incredibly, incredibly weak. Well, let's think about a little of this, this, uh, each of these temptations for just a minute. Obviously, when Satan says, um, you know, you could turn these stones into bread. Well, in the wilderness, uh, and there are today, these uh, these stones, these rocks that have been shaped by wind and rain, the, the uh, harsh elements there, and they indeed look like small loaves of bread. Um, and Satan says, look at this. Don't you, don't you think uh, it would be okay if you used your power? Uh, because after all, you're hungry. So go ahead and do whatever you need to do because you know the end justifies the means. No, that's not the way it works. So um, he refused to take, Jesus refused to take uh, matters into his own hands. He had the power to do so. But once again, he was choosing to submit himself. Again, the, the word meek comes into play here. Meek is not weak. It is a submission to a higher authority. It's channeling your strength for something that is truly good. So when we... Uh, we are in situations where it might be easier for us to just do it our way regardless. Um, part of the lesson here is how much do you trust God? Do you really believe that he will provide? Uh, Matthew 6, uh, again, here in the Sermon on the Mount, in, 33, in verse 33, uh, Jesus says, Seek God first. Seek, seek his kingdom, his righteousness and the things that you need will be provided. Um, do we really believe that? The second temptation was um, for him to jump off the pinnacle of the temple, which would have been tremendous. Uh, you can imagine, uh, given enough time and promotion, uh, you know, if it had been done, done right, we could have made it bigger than the Super Bowl. Uh, can you imagine somebody just jumping off the height of the temple, crashing down in the valley of stones below and, and uh, all, of that, all of a sudden, miraculously, he's, he's saved from that. Um, Jesus could have flaunted his power. 
there were people all around him that wanted him to do that. You see him heal people. You see him actually raise somebody from the dead. And you're thinking, wow, uh, man, he could use that power uh, to get us back on top. We could drive Rome away and we could become the greatest nation just like we're supposed to be. Well, Jesus had a higher view and a greater goal than that. He wasn't about to play politics as much as we try to insert him into our politics. Um, Jesus is not going to lower himself uh, to be wrapped in a flag or uh, a particular ideology, not when the most important thing he had on his agenda was to please his father. So Jesus wasn't going to abuse uh, his power. Um, he could have used the host of angels to come and rescue him. Uh, and the greatest example of that is is on the cross. Uh, he could have called for the uh, hosts of heaven to come and and um, and save him from that awful death, but um, that would not have fit God's purpose. And he was committed; he was surrendered to that purpose. And finally, um, Satan says, "I'll I'll make you king of everything. I'll make you king of the world." And Jesus, uh, he didn't laugh at this because uh, th- this is serious, obviously. Uh, but he did tell Satan, "Get out of here." be gone. Um, he wasn't about to, again, lower himself to something that uh, might sound grand and glorious. And it's unfortunate to watch men and women who uh, reach the pinnacle of success only to find out that the ladders they climbed are leaning against the wrong wall. Uh, they've had to step over people, own people. They've uh, um, surrendered their ethics. They've chosen um, a path that uh, does them no honor. And if all you've got left at the end of the day is, well, you got the corner office, but you don't have anything else. Um, John D. Rockefeller, I've done some study in his life, and one of the things he one time said was that the the poorest man uh, in the world is a man who had no friends. Um, He had some other things to say about the great wealth he obtained, but um, there's some value in that. that what are you willing to sacrifice? Um, you can you can take the temporal at the expense of the eternal. I don't think that's the way to go. So uh, Satan is unsuccessful. He cannot sway Jesus. He cannot tempt him uh, to accede to the opportunities that Satan says are so abundant. It's interesting here, and as we close this, it's important to to realize that Satan wasn't finished. The Bible says that Satan left Jesus for a more opportune time, which simply meant that Satan was going to continue to do everything he could to thwart the the mission, to uh, detract, um, to distract Jesus from uh, his ultimate goal. Thank goodness that in this season of preparation of confession, we can turn to a Lord who has been tempted in all ways as we have, yet without sin. As you and I think about that during this holy season, may we spend time on our knees, in our Bibles, in prayer and meditation, in confession, do what we can to realize how great our God is and how much we need him. God bless you. Hope you have a good week.